Do we need Plato? How has Plato and Socrates influenced Stoicism? And what ancient philosophical tactics can help warriors and the working class as well as everyone else alike? Hello, my name is Anya Leonard. I'm the founder and director of Classical Wisdom, a site dedicated to bringing ancient wisdom to modern minds. And you're listening to Classical Wisdom Speaks. This week, I'm talking with a fantastic guest and we'll discuss Stoic tactics, how early ancient philosophy influenced Stoicism, as well as the value of Plato today. But before we get into that, a very quick announcement. This May 21st, historically known as Plato's birthday, you can join a historic inaugural conference, Keep Philosophy Alive, and hear today's speakers speak live. All donations go to the reconstruction of Plato's Academy in Athens, a truly great and important cause. Simply click the link below for more information. Now, please enjoy this conversation with Nancy Sherman, who holds the rank of Distinguished University Professor at Georgetown University and has been elected as a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. She is a New York Times notable author and her most recent book is Stoic Wisdom, Ancient Lessons for Modern Resilience. We'll delve into Stoic and wisdom and much more. Enjoy. Um, Okay, well, I wanted to start off with your excellent book, Stoic Wisdom. Uh, You show how wisdom can sort of help a whole wider range of people like warriors and and the working class and and maybe people who who don't historically are associated with academia. So it's it's kind of showing philosophy for for a wider range of people. Um, But maybe we could start with a few examples of how this ancient philosophy can give very practical assistance to people. Right. So uh, ancient Stoicism really was, once it landed in the hands of the Romans, a kind of street philosophy. And what appealed especially was uh, um, practices for being able to deal with the precariousness of life. And uh, Seneca, for example, is exiled for seven years in in Corsica. And then, of course, is um, after being in Nero's grace, good graces, isn't in his good graces. And so has to is there's a forced suicide. So you get just a sense um, right away thinking about that. There's vulnerability in life. And the Stoics uh, give you some ideas for how to handle that, that were helpful then and now. And amongst them are things uh, that some people have heard about before, such as anticipate the future or pre-rehearse the bads that could befall you in the future so that you're not blindsided. It's not that you pre-traumatize yourself, which is what my students sometimes worry about. Really? You know, that sounds horrible. Like I'm thinking about (laughs) losing my child or my parents dying all the time. No. It's just that you shouldn't be an avoider um, and avoidant, uh, develop that trait, but rather be a little bit more open to what bads could befall you so that you have some strategies. That's one of them. And I I often say that my my mom was in a nursing home and and I must have been channeling Epictetus, one of the (laughs) Romans uh, who himself was a, a enslaved person, when I figured at 97 and she still hasn't talked about death, we've got to do something about that. So it occurred to me as the person in charge of her her finances and the like, I said, mom, just remind me, did we sign up for the immortality plan? Because if we did, it's gonna be really expensive. At which point I had her full attention and we could, uh, as the Stoics sometimes say, memento mori, think about death, it will happen. Uh, We made a game out of it, a bit of a dance, but it was um, the way to go forward. Um, So that's one um, strategy or practice. Another one is called mental reservation. You tag on to your intentions a little bit of a, 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 what if it doesn't happen? What if it doesn't work out? So it's a bit of an if clause that says, "Hmm, I'll do this unless it rains. I'll do this assuming that I can. So it's a bit like a, um, you know, I I often think of it in in terms of the trading model and on on the um, Wall Street exchange floor. Um, Past 
performance is no guarantee of future performance, that sort of thing. You know, you got to be open to things that happen. Um, it's sort of like uh, Taleb's uh, thinking about Thanksgiving. You know, the turkey can spend his whole life having a wonderful time and never realize the day before Thanksgiving that things can just suddenly change. That's true. We're not turkeys, but there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, so there, uh, and you know, another one is self-reflection that's, that we've certainly picked up on the, um, you know, psychotherapeutic model of sorts. And that is that you, uh, you, you think about your day, you think about the, uh, the goods and the bads, and you reflect, I'm sure, uh, it, it made its way from Socrates, the self, uh, um, self-examination and the unexamined life is not worth living into Aristotle thinking about the flourishing life um, right up to the Stoics and then into Freud in the more modern version of a talking therapy to think about your life. So those are amongst some things. They have their ups and downs, but that, uh, meaning their good sides and their bad sides, but that's the general idea. And so would, would the warriors, would soldiers have more reason to think about death pretty regularly. I mean, I guess they, they're they gonna be more directly in conflict with, or in have those ideas in their face, basically. Well, in the case of soldiering, which I, and I've spent a lot of time talking to uh, service members um, over 30 years or so, um, you know, they are uh, in very high stakes situations and they've gotta be able to keep calm under enormous duress and deprivation. So the idea of having, of sort of knowing what you can control and what you can't, and, and that doesn't mean being passive, but being very uh, empowered in taking on as much responsibility as you can and as much um, agency as you can, but somehow not beating up on yourself all the time if you fail or if things just don't work out. That's hard for all of us. I mean, one thing we're very good at is shame and blame because we're in control of that. Um, and, you know, I have to say the Stoics aren't always terrific in getting you out of that problem because they're, they're moralizers of a sort. And we tend, when we take responsibility for our actions to be sometimes hyper moralizers, but we still need to be able to um, sort of know what we could or couldn't control and try to move on to, in some cases, and especially in the cases of those on the front lines, whether they're in the military, in hospitals, or labor unions, or, um, or uh, sort of in tech where things aren't working out well, uh, whatever level you're at, to be able to say, well, I did my best, but I just can't change this one. And I'm not going to beat up on myself. And also to be able to turn to others. I'm very, uh, I very much think a credible stoicism isn't a self-help, go-it-alone stoicism. I can't read and don't read the Stoics that way. I think you'd be hard-pressed to read um, Marcus Aurelius in that vein. I think you'd be very hard-pressed to read Seneca in that vein. Um, I think a credible stoicism for modern times is one that recognizes the kind of message that um, Seneca gives in even uh, Hercules rages his play, and that is um, Hercules does this horrible deed when he's um, blinded and he kills his family after finishing his labors, and um, he wants to kill himself and probably does at some point. But his father and his best friend says, um, his best friend says, use your heroic courage to show yourself um, mercy essentially self-care, self-empathy that comes from another. So stay connected, lean on others, find your sustenance and support through the resilience that we give each other. And Marcus puts it really wonderfully. Where if you've ever seen bodies on a battlefield, he, he must have been thinking of the detritus of the day when he was in the Germanic campaigns on the Danube. And you see limbs cut off from the trunk. That's what we make of ourselves and we cut ourselves off from each other. Um, so he talks a lot about bonds and fellowship and the common humanity of, of being members of the, of the cosmos, of the globe, of the world. 
I think that's an excellent, excellent point. And I think it's one of those difficulties that people who, who love ancient philosophy run into is that the modern conceptions of what Stoicism is can be so different from what the ancient philosophy is. And I think one of the major differences is that sense of community and connection to people. Um, and as opposed to that sort of stiff upper lip concept that um, is, is the misconception that so many have today. But um, you mentioned that the Stoicism can help, uh, and it, but it has these issues with moralizing. That there's other philosophies that can also help with some of the, you know, we commonly talk about Stoicism with regards to loss or meaninglessness, stress, uncertainty. What are some of the other ancient philosophies that can provide tools for people to handling these issues? So the Stoics kind of come in in part because Aristotle recognizes the precariousness of life, especially uh, in, in terms of our friendships and, and, uh, and losses, personal losses of, of those we love. And, um, but he leaves it a little bit up in the air without hard solutions. And, and maybe we shouldn't have hard solutions, frankly, um, because we, we don't ever want to be inured to loss but we need to still be able to cope or manage. So Aristotle essentially calls a spade a spade. You know, he says, well, what happens? This is Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics um, in book nine on friendship. He says, what, what happens if, you, if, if in a friendship where you really were valuing someone as having a good character and being a good person, that person is no longer a good person. They do something horrible or their true colors uh, reveal themselves to you and you've got to make a decision you let go um, or do you go down um, you know down the drain with them and he's adamant you let go now you got to say that's a loss it's a loss both of how of a friendship but a loss of of what you thought you valued in someone and maybe you did value that in the person so we're constantly dealing with disappointment and trying to not be uh, too harsh on others, but at the same time, protect ourselves, but also um, promote the values in the world that we really care about. So I feel very strongly that Aristotle in many ways gives you the nuances of relationships. He is the philosopher who gives you two books of 10 in the Nicomachean Ethics and similar numbers in the Eudemian Ethics, a, a much less um, read book and, and probably a spurious work, but students at students' hands, the Magnum Aurelia work, and the politics, all about our affiliations, how we live in communities and how that makes us vulnerable. So, but, you know, vulnerable where we still can hold on to our sense of what's, what's good. And so he makes it very clear that if someone um, is, has become a bad person, it's your obligation to let go of the friendship. I can't think of how, uh, you know, a, a more important lesson in current times. <laughs> um, but it's also a lesson for, well, what happens if someone's really was your close friend, but because of war, uh, you're now on opposite sides, um, where, you know, this could be Ukrainian and Russians. This could be um, Hutu and Tutsis. Um, in Rwanda, um, we don't have to go very far to find these um, uh, former former friendships that all of a sudden, from due to powers beyond your control, um, become problematic. And so Aristotle is very much aware of that, and he wants to help you negotiate that. You know, he sort of walks you through it. You may have to let go, um, and he doesn't say you should never form friends or beware when you form a friend that you could lose it. I mean, he doesn't give you, read you the riot act about these matters. He rather just walks you through in a quiet way, the sorts of things. So I think that's a very um, important lesson. And I always find myself returning to Aristotle's books on friendships, on friendship to sort of think about the complexities of what for me is the most, one of the most important aspects of my life. And then I don't just mean friendship, but friendships that are chosen, but family um, and um, uh, others that um, are intimate in your life. 
Yeah, and I think that's a great distinction too that, I mean, he focuses on friendship, but there's many different types of friendships and that different types of relationships. I, I feel like nowadays we are more likely to have a level of friendship with our partners that maybe they might not have historically had during Aristotle's time period. And, you know, my husband's my best friend. So like it is makes it more complicated sometimes to superimpose sort of strict definitions of, of friendship, according to Aristotle in our modern world where men and women can interact a bit more freely. Um, so I, I like that you can expand that to saying the relationships we have in general in our lives and, and to, to realize that there are different types of relationships and that we need to nourish the good ones and and cut off the bad ones. Right, absolutely, absolutely. And, you know, and some of them are very complex, um, political relationships, political friendships, um, uh, business relationships, he includes those. Um, and um, what do you do when you're in a boardroom or you're in a well, like you work for Amazon, right? And you don't think management is treating you well. So you maybe, uh, you know, have to protest in order to get the, the, uh, the goods that are important in life, um, welfare goods, um, health insurance and reasonable working hours and the like. Um, so these are real, these are real issues. He takes up the issue of, uh, he calls them utility friendships, but he really means friendships that are in the workplace. Yeah. Aristotle leaves things a little less neatly tied up than the Stoics. And that's the Stoics entry point. So Aristotle will say the flourishing life has all these goods. And, you know, and actually I recently asked my students to put them on the board and they had all the external goods in the world and they didn't really put good character up there. You know, it was like an afterthought, which was surprising to me. But once it was up, and then we sort of said, well, which ones are, are more likely to be lost or you know, subject to fortune, um, good and bad. And of course, all the external goods were more likely to be lost, those things that are outside your character. And Aristotle nonetheless says, but we need them in our life, because how can you really be a good person in a really, really horrific situation of deprivation, you know, um, where they're limited goods, you're primo levy, it's, you're in a prison camp in Auschwitz, and there's only so much food, you're going to start bargaining a bit, where you might, the bargaining may get a bit harsh, so that you just can get a slice of bread, a, a, a morsel um, that someone else maybe needs, but you're hungrier or you're weaker. And so these kinds of, um, of uh, ways in which you're kind of out of control a bit because of, you're at the mercy of the external goods is something that Aristotle leaves to your case by case by case judgment. How are you gonna discern the particulars, he says, in a really wise way? It's up to you case by case. The Stoics just wanna say, Whoa, we don't really want those kind of goods in a good life. Virtue is going to be sufficient because once you put those other goods in, then you're really subject to fortune. Well, so then they have to re-describe all those goods. They call them preferred and dispreferred indifference. They do a long, long song and dance to be able to demote their value while still somehow saying, it's better to have them than not have them. They just can't make or break your happiness. But there's a lot of language that has to go in there in order to explain, well, how does that really become a credible philosophy of life? I mean, I do that. Uh, you know, I think the book Stoic Wisdom is a, is a way of making them more, the Stoics more reasonable. But sometimes they, they draw stripes that are far too bright and a little bit too crisp. And Aristotle is more willing to live with a little bit more murkiness in order to maybe be as he is, the philosopher of common sense. And, and you know, it's, it's interesting you bring back, coming back to Stoicism, because Stoicism really is enjoying a bit of a renaissance, it feels like right now. And people are talking about it, and it, it's becoming um, more popular 
which is great. I like to think of it as sort of a, a gateway drug into ancient philosophy, you know, and, <laughs> and Marcus Aurelius is leading the way. Um, but, but I don't think many people are as aware of the other influences into Stoicism that Plato and Socrates and Aristotle also influenced the Stoics. Um, so perhaps uh, you could sort of elaborate a bit more on the influences to Stoicism from other earlier ancient philosophers. Sure. So Socrates is often held up as the uh, paragon, uh, the model of the Stoic sage. And you know, he's a very, very influential figure in the ancient world, never wrote a thing. Uh, uh, his famous disciple is Plato, and we get all of a lot of Socrates through Plato, but also from Xenophon. And Socrates uh, was an oral philosopher who did sort of believe that your virtue is, and, and something in your character inside is what uh, is critical to living well. Um, he was a person of the, of, the, of the political sphere and he died by the political sphere famously um, in, in the, one of the most famous trials in the history of Western philosophy that Plato uh, recants in the Apology. So he, that's an influence because Socrates really thought, or at least as Plato kind of uh, retails it, that uh, virtue is sufficient for good living. It, you need character, you need good character, and you can endure all sorts of hardships. He famously endured all sorts of hardships. He walked barefoot in the cold. He didn't eat very much. He, uh, he was a remarkable warrior. He, um, he could drink without getting drunk. He could talk all night and teach all night and then still go outside and you know think about difficult thoughts, say his <laughs> disciples. Um, and he was willing to die for his beliefs. Um, he he um, w was falsely accused of corrupting the youth, of not believing in the, the city gods and, and turning the lesser arguments into the stronger. And he, and he didn't wanna run away or be a fugitive. I'll take my luck. He was, he was uh, condemned and he famously drunk the hemlock and he dies. So that's, a, a, and that model of, of endurance is very much a stoic um, a source of inspiration. Um, Plato follows the story of how do you develop the idea of, of um, virtue being uh, a character state? And he famously develops uh, dialogues or develops ideas around justice, courage, piety, temperance, and the like. And the Republic is, remains one of the most important dialogues. Um, but I'm also, and that's about justice, of course, but I'm also very partial to um, the symposium about love. It's a kind of um, a, a gathering, a seder almost, where people sit around the table, they give a toast uh, to the goddess of love, Eros, and they tell you what, uh, what, what are the wonderful features of, of this goddess. And that's one of my favorites. And, um, Socrates is an interlocutor in that, in that. So the Stoics, um, you know, they don't, I don't think there's anything in Stoic literature that is as fun as the symposiums. I, I think the symposium is absolutely terrific piece of literature. So, um, you know, maybe, maybe some of the plays, but the idea of moving virtue from just behavior out there, which it had to be in very ancient times to, uh, a state of your character is something we really are indebted to uh, Plato for having done. He develops the idea of excellent states of character. That is what virtue is, excellent states of character. Now, Aristotle comes along and says, wait, uh, good character can't just be in possession. It has to be in use or exercise. You can't just have it and then be asleep, you know, for hundreds of years. You got to, rubber's got to meet the road. So it's got to be not just potential, but actualization. And once it's actualized, you actually need a lot of external goods. If you're going to be generous, you need some money and or time. And if you're going to be have a friendly spirit, you need someone on the other end who's going to be your friend. 
and possibly requite your or reciprocate your goodwill. And you know, temperance you may be able to do on your own um, because it's very self-regarding. But most of the others, you need some other other things around. And if you're going to be um, uh, just, you really need structural systems in place that allow you to be just um, in a fair and equitable way. So entree the stoics whoa you're going to put all those external goods in the into the good life in order for you to have a good life well that becomes a very risky business says epictetus i was enslaved in phrygia you know in cyprus now oh, i didn't have a shot at you know at a good life there but i could cultivate goodness inside as socrates had told us or Seneca says, you know, here I am in Corsica. It's not the playland that we now think of in the Mediterranean, but it's pretty grim in those days. I've been banished by Claudius. Eight years, seven, eight years. It's not glorious here. I can barely get enough to eat. Um, I am going to have to cultivate inner, inner goods and not depend on outer goods. So this constant back and forth between what's outside you and what's inside you is uh, an ancient, a, a, a Western ancient story. And you get different extremes. I'd say Aristotle is the always the moderate guy, wants some of both without drawing bright, bright stripes. And the Stoics want it very clean. They want to draw bright stripes. Um, and they you know, and they invent a lot of new words in order to draw those bright stripes. And, and I'd say if you want a credible stoicism, you have to soften it up a bit or, or not take it at its most um, shock and awe uh, 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 proclamations. I think Epictetus really goes in for the shock and awe. Just reading um, uh, the Enchiridion, the handbook um, two days ago with my undergraduates, you know, they, they're rolling their eyes. They can't believe some of <laughs> the hyperboles in there. And I have to say, I'm with them on that. <laughs> yeah, I was rereading discourses recently as well. And it was, it was just um, some of the examples, you know, of people just running away from their sick children and such, <laughs> you know, well, it's very, very extreme. But to, to, reiterate what you were just saying too though that Epictetus does refer to Socrates a lot I mean he he draws they're looking for words. models you know they're looking for um icons and you know and, and it and it, he draws on Socrates a lot he, it is you know sort of um the religious figure of a non-religious era <laughs> and um you know, and we don't know much. We're all, de we're dependent on Plato for that and Xenophon. So, you know, it's, there was a cult image that was developed well before our time and, you know, and, and right there for, for the picking in the hand of a glorious writer. I mean, Plato is remarkable in that regard. So it really, he was made into a kind of iconic figure. I have to say, but he's also weird. There's no way he wasn't weird. Socrates was pretty ugly. His eyes were going out this way. He had a snub nose. He, you know, well, we also know of him through Aristophanes. He really would argue right through the night and, you know, belong to what does Aristophanes say? The cloud factory, the think machine. <laughs> Sounds like thinking machines. My husband worked for thinking machines for a while, but it's um, a, a tech company. But yeah. Um, so he was created in some ways. I don't, I really do not think, I'm not of the cult where we, where, where we um, have these heroes and we just um, quote them endlessly because they're, they've got, they got pithy things. I really do think that like anything, you got to engage texts critically and know what bits to what bits are worth having and what bits we should correct and how to move forward otherwise we're in you know we're interpreting in ways that really don't don't help us or or, or teach us how to move on equitably um, given our demanding social 
problems in the world and our character um, character challenges. Well, I, I totally agree in the, I like to call it the art of cherry picking, that you're never going to find anybody in history that's perfect. Um, but that doesn't mean you want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. You've got to find the valuable stuff, take away the not so valuable stuff and, and find what wisdom you can um, throughout the ages and, and from all different sources and all different backgrounds. So um, I think there is there is a lot of wisdom out there, uh, it sometimes less obvious, sometimes more obvious. <laughs> but uh, always I think you're absolutely them. right. Absolutely right. That's right. And that's the fun of reading texts that every time or just novels or whatever you read. Uh, you find things that are um, really uh, superb and um, you figure out how to um, move forward with them or, you know, what to do with them, <laughs> how to how to how to play with them, how to write about them, how to teach them and how to have them inform your life. And, and you know what, it's it's part of a great tradition, like it's the great tradition of having these conversations. And I think that's something to remind modern readers that you know, the, the founding fathers of America, they weren't, they didn't necessarily agree with everything that they read. They were also having a conversation as have many intellectuals and philosophers and artists and, and academics throughout the ages. You don't just completely agree with everybody. You, you argue with them, you know, you could be like, please yes. talk, sit down and actually write a letter saying well, how you disagree. That's right write letters to the editors of various newspapers these days, um, but just don't spout off things without argument. Five characters, six characters, <laughs> tweeting them, et cetera, without really engaging in any way, or just having, you know, um, coded words without being able to really explore ideas. The fun about looking at texts is you're exploring ideas without getting stuck in places where certain things are just um, uh, forbidden, forbidden because you can't touch that, that or move on to this subject. Well, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, but I, I do want to you finish up by talking about the Plato's Academy Center. Um, and there's a really, really great event going to be taking place on May 21st, uh, which is historically considered Plato's birthday. Um, by and, my son's, and my son's birthday, I have to tell him, you know, ah. that he's in good company. You should have <laughs> well, named I'm, him Plato. <laughs> unplanned event. <laughs> Um, but it, it's a really great conference. It, it's going to be taking place um, in to help uh, raise awareness about the actual reconstruction of Plato's Academy Center, um, which is a very exciting project taking place in Athens. And so for this conference, we're sort of bringing together sort of world renowned experts, philosophers, um, brilliant thinkers and authors like yourself, uh, and you will also be speaking. So would you be able to give us just a very short teaser about what you will be talking about at this event? Sure, I'm going to uh, talk about Aristotle and the Stoics on flourishing. So a little bit of what we were talking about just now, the role of uh, uh, external goods and inner goods and what the Stoics were reacting to in, um, in, in their idea of uh, virtue being so central and the indifference being um, things you have to sort of select uh, wisely, but they aren't themselves going to make or break your happiness. So that's a, that what I'm talking about. And the subtitle is something um, from the painted uh, from the painted porch, which is where the Stoics uh, work to the Lyceum, back to the Lyceum. So uh, thinking about the actual physical space, much like the like Plato's Academy, um, where um philosophizing took place so that's that's what i'm thinking about and i want to give aristotle a bit of a run for his money so that we can see um what a philosopher uh who's a little harder to read probably um than some of the stoics but i don't think that hard to read by, um uh is up to in writing um ethical treatises Yes, I, I, I agree. I love I love Aristotle, but he's a little bit less accessible for, for newcomers. And as you said, something like Symposium is just a joy to read. Um, and Plato is, is such an excellent writer. Uh, so just to, to as a final question, why do you think people today should care about Plato and Plato's Academy? 
I think some of the questions that Plato raises that I was teaching, for example, um, this semester and last semester are so central to the health of civilization. For example, the real, real worry about the idea that justice for some really is just might, power, nothing more than that. It had, and for some, it has everything to do with um, grab and take and nothing at all to do with institutions and structures that support the common good. Plato would just uh, turn in his grave on the site of the academy, wherever his grave is, to hear that. Um, and so you, you don't have to believe in the specific structures and noble lies that go into the building of the Republic or think that uh, philosophers only can come back and rule, they have to be dragged back to rule um, after 50 years of education or something like that. And they've been to the mountaintop. But you should believe that those who uh, think about the common good are educated and have a sense of the common good that just isn't their um, their their grand their their largesse. Their, um, so that's a critical contribution. The idea of 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 just institutions. Forget how he spells that out, but the a commitment to justice that isn't what Thrasymachus thought it might be might makes right. That's the opening gambit. Show me that justice pays, says Thrasymachus. And he, by that, he means that you can rape, pillage, and plunder by doing just things just in the way you could if you didn't. What better lesson is that from, um, the, from an ancient text? I, I, it'd be hard. Or, so, or Plato's apology. Um, someone is willing to argue in court for the right to be able to teach openly in classrooms, even if the views are unpopular. Uh, where, isn't that what we're talking about right now in many of our classrooms here in the United States? So, or, you know, or in many political debates. So I, uh, I think um, ancient philosophy is an absolute must to understand where we are and how we can do better. And also just how we can have Communication. It's all uh, Plato's about interlocutors. They're they're talking one one to another and and always asking that question. What is it? TSD in Greek, and um, uh, and what's the definition of that? And how does that go? You, and you don't have to be litigious, but you but you certainly can be reflective. So those are among some of the reasons. But that's an argument for education. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Nancy. It's wonderful talking to you again. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure and I hope everyone can enjoy both Stoic Wisdom and get to see you live speaking on May 21st. Uh, and I'll put links below to both your excellent book and to anybody who would like to register for the event so they can ideally read your book and then see you live and talk and ask questions themselves. Sounds wonderful. I'm game for that. Thank you so much, Anya. It was great talking to you.